say good morning to begin. Good morning to those who are here. We, it's encouraging to have a good number present in our in-person assembly this morning. We hope that continues to improve and increase. We say good morning to those who are with us online. We do have visitors present here, and we want you to know that we do appreciate your presence with us and trust that you can worship with us this morning in a way that is pleasing to God and that you will be edified. We turn our attention to the subject in general, it's about the Lord's church. Now that is not any church in every church, it's about the Lord's church. And by that I mean the church that is revealed in the New Testament scriptures, the church that Jesus built, the church that Jesus died to purchase to make it his own, with his own blood, that church. We say, well, that's a big subject. <laughs> it truly is. So we have to focus on some aspect of it, and that's what we're doing this morning. An aspect that we can consider that will be helpful to us at any time, but especially during a time of challenge from a pandemic of a disease, where things have to adapt and change, and not as they normally are, is to recognize that the Lord's Church is a purpose-driven church. A purpose-driven is not a difficult concept when we think about it in application to the church because we should think about it individually. Your individual life should be purpose-driven. The purpose that drives my life is going to heaven. That's the purpose for which I live that drives me to do everything that I do. And I'm sure you are very similar. But when we talk about a purpose-driven church, we're talking about a church that has a purpose that is driven by that purpose. The church has a purpose just as much as we do individually. In other words, we're not progressing, progressing aimlessly here, there, and yon into the future. Uh, we are not wandering unpredictably here, there, and yon. We are driven by a purpose. That means we're moved in a direction to accomplish some very specific things, or at least we had better be. And it's important for us to learn that this purpose does not change. Uh, time does not change it. Physical disease does not change it. The purpose that drives the Lord's church is the same at all times. I'd like for you to turn your Bible with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to read a passage in which the Apostle Paul brings this principle to our attention. And we'll read in, in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 8 and going through verse 13. Paul said unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, was this grace given to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery, which for ages hath been hid in God, who created all things, to the intent that now under the powers in the heavenly places, the principalities and powers might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access in confidence through our faith in him. Wherefore I ask that ye may not faint at my tribulations for you, which are your glory. Nothing was to change that purpose, but here in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul's treatise on the church. We have Paul discussing the church with that specific definite article even in the original language in this passage. You notice it is found in the 10th verse. Uh, he talked about the church in, uh, that, that would be made known through the church. That's the definite statement with a definite article. So Paul is referring to a specific church and there's no question. We would never wonder whether he's talking about uh, some unknown institution, it's the Lord's church, the church that the Lord established and that Paul is working to spread throughout the world. But what we want to note 
is found in verse 11. The apostle said in this passage that according, all of this is according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's take notice before we get into other matters here that the purpose that drives the Lord's church found in that passage as discussed here is first of all God's purpose. It is his purpose. Secondly, the Apostle Paul called it an eternal purpose. It is eternal. That means it is it's not something that is only temporary, but it's something that actually was formulated and determined even before God created the heavens and the earth. He formed this purpose. And then finally, from that passage, we learn that this purpose is in Christ. It's not just anywhere and everywhere. It is only found, it is only followed, it only drives in Christ. But as we look at what can be learned from this, we need to identify for this Bible student and for you exactly what is that purpose that drives us. We can pretty well identify that on an individual basis. We're Bible students, we're Christians, we want to go to heaven. But as a church, what is the purpose that drives, motivates, pushes, and encourages us? Well, that's a good question. That's what I want to spend a few minutes identifying with you uh, this morning. Uh, and that is to, uh, it, it, to note that the Apostle Paul identifies it here in this passage in Ephesians 3 and in other places in Ephesians. And the Apostle Paul is also letting us know that it is never to be altered. He hoped that even his tribulations for them would never alter their faithfulness to this, this purpose. So let's take opportunity with this blank chart to turn our attention to a verse in the same chapter, Ephesians, the third chapter, and verse 10, where, as we have just read, Paul said to the intent that now under the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. Let's underline something that uh, Paul is talking about here that is a specific part of that purpose. Something is to be made known through the church. In other words, God intends for the church to make something known. And in fact, it is about him. Because as we look at this particular part and identify this purpose that drives us, as stated in this passage, it's to make God known. Now, we may go to church, we may live our daily lives, and w without this really being in the forefront of our purpose-driven activities for the church or as a church, but a purpose that drives us is to make God known. Now, what about God does he want to be made known through the church? Well, it is in this verse, the Apostle Paul specifically says, might be made known through the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And so there's no question about that. One of the things that God intends for us to make known is his wisdom. Uh, further, as we look at other uh, passages and other things, it is also to make known his power. We are to make known the power of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So that's referring to our physical bodies. God has placed his treasure of the gospel with us. That the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. So why did God place the gospel in our custody? rather than in the custody of, say, for example, angels or some miraculous beings that would have a supernatural power to protect it. He placed it in your power or in my custody, in your custody, in order that when the job is done and when it's complete and when it has done what God intended for it to do, what is made known is God's power. Because God's power is what enables you to accomplish that. 
we would also add to this list, we are driven by the purpose of making known the love of God. The Apostle John made reference to this in 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 9. He said, by this, the love of God was manifested in us, <laughs> talking about Christians, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so we might live through him. We know that God so loved the world, John 3, 16. But here the Apostle John is writing toward the end of the first century and saying that the love of God is now manifested, made known in us. And so the church is to make known the genuine, the depth, the, the comprehension of the love of God. But there is one other thing that we'll add to this list that we're taught in the New Testament that we're to make known, and that is God's grace. Uh, we would assume that, right? Because we know that this is all possible through the grace of God. Last week we talked about the joy of salvation from Psalm 51 that's made possible by the compassion of God. God's mercy and God's compassion, God's concern and God's care for us. Here represented in the word grace. Paul said, in order that in ages to come, that is, he formulated this in eternity, he might show the surpassing richness of his grace, the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So God has intended for those who are his children, those who are his son's church, to make known, to show his grace. But Paul doesn't just make it in that a simple term. He said the surpassing riches, the riches that surpasses our comprehension and understanding. I have a note that I want to observe with you. And that note simply is what the church is to make known about God is not just his existence. God is, there's no question about that. Atheists all over the place, the denial of God, denial of his word, hear it every day. But God is. And one of the things that we are to make known about God is, of course he exists. But the church is also, obviously, from these, just these four words, are to make known his nature and his disposition toward man. When we make known the wisdom, the power, the love, the grace of God, we're making God known. I would ask a question. Where can you go to see evidence for God's existence? That's a good question. We should think about that once in a while. Where can you go and look and see evidence for the existence of God? Well, we might look well, everywhere around us. <laughs> Everything is really, in fact, evidence for the existence of God by its design and function. That's exactly right. A, a, a starry sky at night, you can see evidence beyond what we can really comprehend for the existence of God. And I say all that to say, the church. God intends for the church, like everything around us, like the starry sky at night with all the design of the universe and its in intricate movements to see evidence for his existence in the church, but not just the fact that he exists, the fact that he has manifold wisdom, the fact that he has unsurpassing power and love and grace. Well, that brings us to another blank chart because we want to look at another purpose. There's something else that the New Testament teaches that we kind of have to add to our thinking here. And lo and behold, it's found also in Ephesians 3. Sometimes sit down when you have opportunity in your spare time to read Ephesians, the third chapter, with notice about Paul's fo focus on the church. But in chapter 3, in verse 21, he said, Unto him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus, unto all generations forever and ever. Amen. You notice Paul again in this chapter 
used a definite article, the church, the Lord's church. But here he's talking about something in that church, and he expresses it in such a way as to show a purpose that the church has. And let's underline that. That purpose is him saying unto him, that is unto God, be the glory. Now we might be able to read that and not give further thought and not really understand what Paul is getting at here. So let's define the word glory. The word glory as the apostle is using it simply means praise and honor that is bestowed or rendered because of greatness, because of worthiness, because of supremacy. So now use your own thinking, your own mind, really what is the purpose here in the church? The purpose of the church is to, is to render unto God because of his greatness praise, honor. What's another word for all of that? Another word, of course, is exactly what we're doing this hour. It's, it's worship. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about worship. Another function of the church is unto God be the glory in the church. Of course, you can worship God as an individual, obviously, at home and prayer and Bible reading and singing. But this is a function of the church. And the church is to function in such a way that it has collective worship. And that purpose of that worship is to bestow praise and honor upon God because of his greatness. And that purpose should drive us. It shouldn't be simply a ho-hum kind of a thing. Oh, if I have to, I'll go to church today. No, it's, it's an activity that is a purpose that is to drive the church. Worship. Rendering unto God because of his worthiness, because of his greatness, because of his supremacy, praise and honor. So let's specify a few things that the New Testament teaches that we're taught as to how to do this. Does he just leave it up to us? Is worship in spirit, that is from the heart, from the inward man, and in truth, just at random? No. We are given some very specific activities. One of them is singing. We're driven by the purpose to worship God by singing, which we've been doing this morning. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 said, Speaking one to another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. We're not entertaining here. That is never a part of scriptural teaching on music in the church. It's never entertainment. It is never rendered for the purpose of pleasing God people. It is never done with the purpose of one or a group singing to others. Never. That's added outside New Testament teaching. But Paul addresses the church and said, you folks, all of you, I want you to speak to one another. All of you speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And the Apostle Paul, in writing to Colossians, in a parallel passage to this, in 3.16, said, speaking to one another, teaching and admonishing one another. And so in speaking to one another, we are teaching, we are admonishing, in other words, encouraging. But the foremost purpose is that we are to solo, which is the expression here, make melody. There's a lot said about that. We could get into that, but that's what Paul is translated accurately. Make melody. Where? In your heart. And so as we speak with our voice, the melody is to be in the heart. It is to come from the heart. And that is a purpose that should drive us. Well, that's not all. There is gospel preaching. And I'm not just saying this because this gospel preacher is talking, this is a New Testament pattern. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said to Timothy, now Timothy happened to be at the church at Ephesus when uh, this epistle was written to him. The Apostle Paul had left him there, but he said, take heed to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this, you shall save both yourself and them that hear you. God has a purpose for gospel preaching, and therefore every gospel preacher should be driven by this purpose. 
And the church should be driven to have this purpose so that the word of the gospel, the word of God, is proclaimed and the individual, such as Timothy or any gospel preacher, is to continue for a twofold purpose. He's got to save himself. And by doing that, he will save those that hear. That's an interesting thought when you follow that through of what's happening in gospel preaching. Them that hear gospel preaching can be saved by that gospel preaching. It's not just an incidental thing. It's not just a time-consuming activity to fill an hour. It is an activity that God has given with a purpose that should drive us. But we've got other things to talk about. <clears throat> Our giving is an act of worship. That's why we give upon the first day of the week. According to Paul's instruction to the church at Corinth, upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by in store as you may prosper. He had already given this instruction to the churches of Galatia. In addition to this, there is also, of course, praying. Praying is worship because we bow before the throne of God and acknowledge his greatness and express to him our love and our, our adoration for him. But we do that also in the assembly of the church and we've done that this morning. I have a, a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Remember that 1 Corinthians 14 was written to the church at Corinth to give them instruction concerning their assemblies. They were abusing the spiritual gifts that's not our concern this morning or our study. But it's with the activities that Paul acknowledges that they were doing together in an assembly as worship. And he had already mentioned, and we'll, we'll mention here in a moment, the Lord's Supper. But he said, what is it then? I will pray in this assembly uh, with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. So in other words, the church at Corinth had prayer in their assembly. They had singing in their assembly, and it was to be done with the Spirit, and it was to be done with understanding. And that's all important, in, and that's a purpose that was driving the church. And Paul was trying to help the church at Corinth alone. But then, certainly, we've had quite a bit to say of recent times about the um, <clears throat> Lord's Supper, but it's an important part. The way our services are arranged today, we're kind of work up to the what I regard as the best part. We have it at the end. We end with the best, and that's observance of the Lord's Supper, which we'll do here in a few minutes. It's, it's just simply, uh, as we continue to say and emphasize its importance to all of us, a part of the worship of the Lord's church, we are driven to observe the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week. That drives us. And it's really uh, uh, the height of our worship as we bow before the throne of God, remembering Christ, his death for us. We'll get to that in just a moment. We'll look forward to that. But that is a purpose that drives us. We're a purpose-driven church. Well, I've got another blank chart, and that means we're, we're looking at another purpose here. We're going to begin in this time in, uh, as we go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and verse 11. Uh, the apostle said, he gave some. This is Christ, after he ascended, gave gifts unto men. This is the way Paul specifies. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some shepherds and teachers. Now some of those words are underlined, and the ones that are underlined are those that continue today. Apostles and prophets were temporary, dependent upon the foundation of the church and the miraculous spiritual gifts, but preachers, shepherds, or pastors, or elders, and teachers continue today. Okay, then Paul explained in verse 12, Christ did this and gave these for the perfecting of the saints under the work of ministering, under the building up of the body of Christ. Well, that's Paul's statement of purpose. 
Why did the Lord give these offices, these individuals in his church? Well, it's in this verse, as we know, that we'll underline just one little word there, work. There's a work to be done. And that's what all this is about. Uh, and if, if we single this out and say, what work is that? It's work for Christ. It's not secular. It is spiritual. It is the work that the Lord gave his church. And so it is the so that we never make mistakes. That's not what that means. That just simply means growing spiritually. So that we grow, we, we are spiritually edified, we get stronger. And then in addition to that, that's unto the work of ministering. The word ministering there is not referring to the work of an evangelist, it's referring to the activity of every saint, every Christian, is to do the work of ministering. What's that? Service. That's what that word means. That's all that word is talking about. Diakonos is service. And oftentimes that involves benevolence. It involves serving the needs of others. But then finally, it's unto the building up of the church, of the body of Christ. That's what the verse says. And this is the word here that does not, in this case, refer to the spiritual growth, which is in the perfecting. This building is adding living stones upon what Christ built. In other words, it's a growing numerically that is the work, as you and I often say, evangelism. It's preaching the word to try, to the best of our ability, to convert the lost. The apostle said to the church at Corinth, wherefore, my beloved brethren, to them, based on these principles, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, not the work that was humanly devised, not the work that originated with a church. It's the work that originated with the Lord, that he gave his church. And therefore, it is a sign to us. It is not secular, but it is spiritual. Let it be understood from this passage why we are purpose-driven. We are purpose-driven to do this work for Christ because we are instructed to be steadfast. We are instructed to be unmovable. And we're instructed to be always abounding. Those are words that all of us can understand. I think we have a blank chart next. That means we're going to look at a fourth and last purpose. There's another verse in the New Testament that was written by the Apostle Paul, this time also to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3 and in verse 9, He's straightening out some problems that they were dividing over, Apollos, Peter, and so forth. He said, we are just God's fellow workers. You are God's husbandry, God's building. He goes on from that, and that makes an interesting study. But our interest this morning is in what he said the church is. And this not only identifies what the church is, it gives the church purpose. You are God's husbandry. Now, if Paul were here, he would say the same thing to us. You are God's husbandry. Whether it was in the first century or the 21st century, the church is God's husbandry. And therefore, with that statement, we need to have a little bit of explanation, a little bit of understanding. What are we as God's husbandry? Well, the word itself literally means a tilled or cultivated field. We have a, a, a lot of you are getting ready for husbandry. <laughs> it's getting to be the garden season where everybody gets the urge to get out there and get that ground worked up, get those seed in the ground. You've got to wait till this frost has passed, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's husbandry. You have a garden, and that special location on your property that is your garden is your husbandry. 
Now, what this church is, figuratively speaking, is God's husbandry. And therefore, it figuratively signifies a place where God does his gardening, where God applies himself to bring forth a harvest. Okay, let's take that a step further, and let's draw this circle, which is the local church, that has this purpose. That local church, be it here or wherever the local church may be, is God's husbandry. And this is what it means. It means it is a place where people who are God's people are prepared for heaven. That's the harvest. The church has the purpose of being the place where God is developing people that will be able to spend eternity with him in heaven. We can't just up and do that. It takes some, it takes some doing. We can't save ourselves. We can't all of a sudden become what we need to be, to be the strength and purity that is of heaven. But the local church is designed to be that. So the local church has the purpose of being a place where people like us are prepared to go to heaven. Now when you think about that, that purpose should drive us. It should just push us uh, to what we, and, and I have su suggested some things that we do that is uh, preparing us. Worship, what do you think heaven's going to be like? It's going to be an eternity of worship. And some folks today said, I don't want to go to church. It's boring. I don't want anything to do with church. Have to get, and all of that complaining about church because we go to worship. And if you want to go to heaven, heaven is going to be forever worship. We better get used to it. We better like it if we want to go to heaven. There's an alternative. But we want to go to heaven. And what we do in worship is God's husband of preparing. It is also teaching and preaching the word. Preaching and teaching the word of God now is preparing us for heaven. It's being together, having a unity of the spirit that is a togetherness here, a peace and harmony that will be like the peace, a foretaste, I guess it would be good to say, of what it will be like in heaven. And then finally, just being among people that care for you, that care for one another. And we try our best. And sometimes it's difficult. And there are things that interrupt this. There are things that make it difficult. There are things that challenge. And sometimes it seems like it, if not impossible, but we press on. And that's what we're doing during this COVID-19 pandemic. And that's what I want to be understood with this sermon as we add this to our series of COVID-19 sermons. It's almost a year now, March 2020. It's March 2021, almost a year, that we've been at this, adjusting, changing, live streaming trying our best to maintain the integrity of the Lord's church. And when we look at this passage, one of the things that we cannot veer from, one of the things that we cannot change is our purpose. It will not change with time or with changes of culture, with disease. The purpose of the Lord's church will not change, and it drives us. according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the development of that passage for our edification in this worship today. Those are the things that we have seen, not just in this passage, but in others. It is represented in very understandable statements of the purpose that the Lord has given his church. And let me suggest, if they're not driving you, then let's make some changes and do some growing. Because a local church can be a purpose-driven church when it consists of members who are purpose-driven. If you and I aren't purpose-driven, how can we expect our church to be? 
The church is us. <laughs> the church is not this building. The church is people. It's a collectivity of called out people who are preparing to go to heaven. And so unless those people are purpose driven, the church can never be purpose driven. Unless you are, then you cannot make that contribution to the purpose of this local church. To be a purpose driven member, one must be personally committed to Christ. You must be. To be personally committed to Christ, one must be faithfully obeying his teaching. And that will bring us to our closing chart. Faithfully obeying his teaching involves becoming a Christian. If you're not already a Christian, you should be a Christian. We have in brief what the New Testament teaches. Our purpose as a church is to preach the word, to make it known what the Lord requires of you to become a Christian. And here are the acts of obedience and the passages in which they're found. It begins with faith. And it, it comes to the point where you say, I want to be baptized. I want to be immersed in water because it's in that immersion that I am united with Christ in the likeness of his death and my sins are washed away. Acts twenty two sixteen, just like they were for Saul of Tarsus who had actually even seen the Lord and still had sin that required him to be baptized for the remission of his sins. But also it's a very possibility that there are those who are Christians who have erred and need to be restored. And the New Testament also has instruction for that. The Apostle Peter gave the guidance for this to Simon in Acts 8. Uh, the Apostle John in 1 John, I see on my notes here, I have chapter 12. 1 John is not, <laughs> it's chapter 2. Somehow that wrong finger hit the number there. That's chapter 2 and uh, uh, verse 9, I, I believe. Let, I may have changed something there, but in 1 John, here's what he said. It may be chapter 1. I'm sorry for the ambiguous nature of this uh, comment about this confession, but I do know what it says. When you turn and open 1 John, <laughs> if we confess our sins, as Christians, the blood of Christ will wash them away. But he is faithful and righteous to forgive us. And that, of course, is what matters. So there may be someone present in this assembly today as we prepare to sing this invitation song that Adam has announced. If you're at home and want to study further, we encourage you to take your Bible, open your Bible, and study what you need to do to be saved and go to heaven. If you need help, then we encourage you to ask us that we may be of help to you. But if there's anyone here present in the assembly today that desires to respond, let us know. All together we stand and sing.